I'd like first of all to thank the um, Helsinki Collegium for the uh, invitation. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and to, sh to share some ideas with you. I'd also like to thank the two organizers personally for a very kind uh, invitation and for very interesting discussion uh, the 24 hours before this session. And I'd also like to thank um, Kirsi in person. I well understand what uh, Alejandro means about relentless perseverance in, in, in delivering results. Um, uh, it's an unusual occasion for me this because of the mix of uh, people and uh, specializations here, the in interdisciplinarity. So I hope I can hold your interest. I will um, present a view that is basically, that basically draws from a political economy perspective. So it has interdisciplinarity built into it. But obviously I hope I can um, meet your standards and open up some avenues that uh, will further debate. Anyway, without any more uh, prevarication, let me get on with it. Uh, what I will do is two things. So it's quite an ambitious uh, talk. I want to present to you some ideas about financialization of capitalism. This is my new book. Um, it will be coming out uh, next year by Versa. I'm about to deliver it next week, so it's done. So I'll give you a sense of what I'm arguing uh, financialization is. And then I want to locate the Eurozone crisis within the financialization uh, of contemporary capitalism and explain to you why I think this is really a, cri a crisis of financialized cap capitalism in Europe. Um, now, it works. These things don't work in England, you see. So. Um, Financialization is a big topic in social sciences, not in economics. Economics tends to be a bit slow when it comes to these things. Uh, new ideas come out usually in sociology, in anthropology, in economic geography, and at some point economists pick them up and formalize them um, and demonstrate them, or think they demonstrate them. Um, so financialization is a very big topic in social science, as I'm sure you know, but, not, but less so in economics. I can't go over the, um, uh, the literature here because I haven't got time and I can't tell you what the uh, various strands, uh, analytical strands are of what financialization is. Let me just say that there is no agreement, there is no common understanding of what it is. It has to do with the rise of finance, of course, but no common understanding of what it is. Here I will present you my view and uh, what this book of mine argues. Briefly speaking, um, I understand financialization to be an epochal transformation of um, advanced capitalism. It is the second bout of the rise of finance. The first bout is at the end of the 19th century, uh, beginning of the 20th century, which itself generated vast debate within political economy and more, more, more generally. Uh, after the Second World War, we can talk about a period of uh, controlled finance, finance being uh, having a limited uh, impact on advanced economies. Um, the period from the mid-70s, early 80s, we can think of as financialization, the second bout of financial ascendancy in advanced capitalism. This second bout, I believe, is in some ways more telling than the first. Um, and the way I understand it, and that's what I want to explain to you briefly, is as a, the asymmetric growth of circulation compared to production. Circulation has expanded enormously, production has not followed suit, and um, as a result, new sources of profit have emerged. And these are fundamental for understanding modern society because, of course, new sources of profit mean new social structures and new uh, layers that uh, benefit from these sources of profit. I'm talking here about mature countries, and I will tell you what. Um, I think is happening in developing countries. Um, although I'll be very brief about that because of time. Um, more specifically, what I'm arguing is that financialization should be understood as an epochal transformation that has to do with the altered conduct of the basic agents of 
uh, capitalist accumulation, the basic agents, the fundamental agents of um, the capitalist economy. In other words, non-financial enterprises, banks, and workers or households, depending on uh, how you go about it. I would have preferred to talk about workers, but I can't because the, the data is about households, so I have to use households. Um, so I will show you some evidence about the altered conduct of these um, um, fundamental agents and therefore the altered dynamics of mature capitalism. Um, the bottom line is that through this altered conduct of the basic agents um, we have new mechanisms of profit extraction, profit extracted in the sphere of circulation, uh, out of uh, income flows and money stocks which various agents taking part in, uh, in, in, in exchange and circulation bring to the sphere of circulation. Uh, it's a process that I, I'd like to call financial expropriation, um, a, a kind of zero-sum game played um, uh, in, in circulation through finance. Finance has rediscovered and re-emphasized its ancient predatory disposition towards the economy and has become a new mechanism, a new set of means for extracting profit in circulation. In that context, and in contrast to the first bout of financial ascendancy, I wish to argue that there is no rentier class in, uh, in modern mature capitalism. Uh, it's almost an instinctive response of people who analyze financialization, whether they come from the post-Keynesian tradition, the Marxist tradition, or simply the heterodox tradition, to seek a rentier class. Financialization is about the rentier, who makes profits uh, and keeps production weak, uh, suppresses the pro productive industrial capitalists. I don't see such a such a social la layer uh, in any of, of any size, and certainly not the layer that makes the decisions. This is not rentier capitalism, as I understand it. The last point I wish to make again very briefly is that <laughs> this is mature financialization. Uh, that I'm talking about and by which I will show you evidence, but there's also subordinate financialization which has emerged in developing countries. And this subordinate financialization is a very recent phenomenon. We can see it very powerfully developing in Brazil, in Turkey, in India, in a whole host of middle income countries where there is scope for finance to expand. This is a derivative process um, to a large extent, ha having to do with global financial flows, the um, entry of foreign banks into these countries and then the spontaneous, uh, 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 the spontaneous burst of uh, domestic financial uh, growth. This is linked to the role of the dollar as uh, world money. It's, it, it pivots on the role of the global monetary system. I haven't got time to go into it. I only mention it because a version of it is happening in Europe. Subordinate financialization has occurred in Europe. The split of the, Europe, of the Eurozone between core and periphery can be understood in those terms. Uh, the countries of the periphery have been financializing, but in a subordinate way, of a particular character determined by the Euro as a special form of, of global money, and this is what I want to uh, say more about. Let me give you a little bit of detail. I will be um, as quick as I can. Let me start with non-financial enterprises because I believe that any kind of political economy of capitalism must indeed start with the productive sector, as it were, the units where uh, production takes place. I'm quite old-fashioned in that respect. Um, so if we look at non-financial enterprises, and the data will show you uh, to do with the United States and Germany to keep uh, a contrast going. If we look at the, uh, but, 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 it, but they also, the data also applies to, um, to the UK, to um, Japan, and to France. France in some ways is the most heavily financialized country in Europe. It's an astonishing thing, but I can't show you the, the French data here. Um, if you look at non-financial enterprises, what you will see are two things. First, a growing detachment of non-financial ent enterprises from banks. I know it sounds surprising if you think about it, because the automatic response is that banks have become more important and non-financial enterprises have become more dependent or perhaps more closely connected with banks. That's not the case. Uh, the, the era of financialization is an era of um, the ascendancy of self-finance. Um, large, big business 
basically finances itself as far as uh, investment is concerned and actually has money left over. Um, again, I can't show you all the, all the evidence, you'll have to take my word for it, but uh, this isn't a time, a period of de dependence of big business, large corporates uh, on banks, it's actually a period of <coughs> increased detachment, independence from banks, but of course with significant variations, uh, and some of these variations I will show you. The second aspect of the non-financial behavior is of course that while this detachment from banks has taken place, we've got increasing involvement of the non-financials in the financial system. Uh, independent involvement. And it's in that complex and contradictory way that we can think of non-financial enterprises becoming financialized. They, they, they are more independent of banks, but more involved in the financial system, and therefore they accrue skills, um, methods, and an outlook. Uh, of profit making that is associated with finance rather than with uh, production. So that's how I would argue financialization works uh, at the level of um, at the level of production. And here is a little bit of evidence. This is the United States. I, can, I can't show you very much because of uh, time. This is from my book. This is the composition of non-farm. Does this work? Yeah. This is the composition of non-farm. Uh, non-financial corporations liabilities it's the liability side in other words how they borrow where they obtain fun borrow or obtain funds from uh, and it's just a just a uh, 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 just a composition out of a hundred it's not it's, it's not uh, in terms of GDP uh, or anything or you, but you can take my word for it it grows in terms of GDP so if you look at the composition it's very clear what's happening loans as a whole decline and what rise what rises uh, basically equities and securities in other words um, Non-financials rely on on internal funds, as I indicated. When you look at uh, non-external funds, what you see is less of a uh, less reliance on banks. Uh, it's very clear for uh, the United <coughs> States. It's also there for Germany. In fact, in Germany, it's even more pronounced. Uh, again, I can't show you all the data, and I can't show you, unfortunately, the financing of investment, but. Again, that should do. You can see that German banks, which have traditionally relied on bank loans, um, German system is a bank-based system. Historically, it's a system of close connections between enterprises and banks. German financial, uh, non-financial enterprises relying heavily on internal funds, less so uh, on bank on, on banks. Now, when we move to banks themselves, we have, in a sense. The, the, the mirror image or rather the, 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 the result of this change uh, at the level of the non-financials because of course when banks have got fewer opportunities for profit making uh, among by lending to non-financials they'll seek other avenues they'll do other things and for banks this has meant two things it has meant first increased lending to other banks and that's the way in which you can see in other words increased involvement in open market transactions which is what lending to other banks uh, has behind it or attached to it. Banks have turned to open markets and have, st have started dealing more with other banks and making profit in that way. And banks have turned towards households uh, for profit. Now there you begin to get in a nutshell the new sources of profitability out of finance. Because financial profit has become a very par large part of total profit. Banks are one of the main sources of total financial profit and one of the main sources of profit for banks or the new sources of profits for banks tend to be transactions in the open markets and dealing with other banks and increased lending to households. This I would argue is financial expropriation. It's a, it's a, it's a new uh, aspect of contemporary capitalism that has to do with profit being extracted directly from circulation from dealing with households and from dealing with other transactors in the financial um, system. Here is a little bit of evidence uh, from, from the United States. You can see that lending to uh, corporates declines. It, it, this is longer term data. The United States is the only country for which you can get consistent data from, for the whole of the post-war period. You can see the financialization <coughs> commencing around about that time, the late 70s, early 80s, and you can see the steady decline in lending to uh, for productive purposes by US banks. Um, you can also see the rise in mortgages, mortgage lending, which is um, very, very pronounced during this period. What you can also see, and I stress this point, I will show you the household data in a minute, there isn't very much lending for, n for, for, for normal consumption purposes. 
people, people automatically think that, yes, people, and people of course know that banks have turned to the households. And, they, and much of the, the sort of the knee-jerk reaction among those who, who analyze this kind of uh, behavior is to say it's because people borrow to consume because wages might be low. That's not the case. That's not what's been happening. Um, Non-collateralized lending, lending for, for consumption isn't particularly strong. What rises is lending for households. Now, there might be consumption lending hiding behind mortgage lending. It's a common behavior. But nonetheless, the main aspect of it is houses and, 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 and housing uh, loans. I'm sorry. This is Germany, where uh, similar things uh, obtain. Lending to domestic enterprises declines, declines uh, significantly uh, from the um, from the uh, early 90s onwards. Uh, significant decline to, to to businesses and a rise in lending to uh, other banks uh, in uh, in Germany. You can see that housing loans also increase but not much and that's where it begins to become interesting. German financialization is actually different to US financialization. That's where you begin to get divergences uh, in behavior. In other words, the traditional distinction between bank-based finance in Germany and market-based finance in the UK and the US hasn't disappeared. It's there. But it's given a different outlook to financialization. Germany is financializing in a different way to, uh, to US and the UK, I would argue. Um, now, if we push on again, I've got to be very quick, so sorry about this. If we push on to households, the third element. Uh, in a sense, we've already seen it. You can see household borrowing increasing, mostly for mortgages. The key element for household borrowing is housing. Uh, and, but you can also see household assets increasing. Now you can ask, why is this happening? Uh, again, the standard response would be, because uh, real wages have not been increasing during this period. And there is no doubt at all about it. If you look at the data, real, the, the increase in real wages is, is, is not comparable to the increase in real wages in the 50s and the 60s. There's, there's definitely a change uh, in the rate of growth of real wages. And in the United States, real wages have been stagnant, basically, for three decades. So you, the standard response is that households are borrowing because of this. Probably, there might be an element in it, but I prefer a, a more structured and, I think, deeper explanation. The reason why house, households have turned to finance both for borrowing but also for assets is because of the retreat of public provision during this period. Uh, what has prevailed in, in a number of countries is the retreat of public provision uh, in the sphere of housing, education, health, uh, and other basic uh, services, but also including pensions, and, 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 and the use of um, household funding, uh, household funds. The retreat of, of public provision has created more room for private provision. Private provision is mediated by the financial system. The financial system has emerged as a mediator of um, basic needs, the, the satisfaction of the basic, uh, fundamental needs of households in mature capitalism. This is a new development, a historically new development. There is no evidence at all historically that finance is qualified to do that. Uh, has got any particular skills in doing that. Uh, and yet there we are, you know, it, it's emerged. Um, that's what explains how financialization of households, both, on, I repeat, both on the liability side, but also on the asset side. It isn't, it isn't enough to look at simply borrowing. Households are financializing for assets too, in terms of what's been happening to uh, pension funds, insurance, uh, 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 and so on. And profit is made in both directions by the financial system. The financial system can also make profit not from borrowing, but also from handling uh, assets. Here is a, a bit of data. This is the United States. This is, this is relative to GDP. So you can see the vast growth of household liabilities relative to GDP in the post-war years. You can see the explosion of it, where financialization really uh, sets in. Uh, and you can see that most of this growth is for ho home mortgages. Unsecured lending, other liabilities, increases, but this isn't really what's driving it. It's housing that's driving uh, the indebtedness of households, and that's logical uh, in this context. It depends, of course, on the housing market, and I'll show you the difference with Germany in a minute. But the, most, the, the largest asset uh, that a household will, can ever acquire is a, is a house, and therefore that's where financialization uh, emerges 
So you can see the mediating role of finance in the acquisition of a roof of your head, basically. Um, here is Germany. The German data is much less, it's much shorter, uh, pure, pure availability. And you, but the difference is clear. Uh, yes, household uh, indebtedness increases, but in the 2000s we've got um, a decline. Of that means. German financialization has been quite different. No housing bubble in, in Germany, basically. And that's really the key difference between German capitalism now and US, UK capitalism now. Um, nonetheless, even in Germany, you can see that the bulk of, of, of housing indebtedness is mortgage loans, not consumer loans. It's the same process, but occurring uh, uh, with significant differences to the, to, 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 to the US. Now, to sum up, in developed countries, I think, what we see is a structural tra transformation at the molecular level of capitalist accumulation. It's profound change, historical change. Finance has found new fields of profit, households and financial transactions. Uh, as a result, we've got a changing social structure, people who make profits and earn incomes in that way, but no return to the rentier. Uh, what we've got is profit extraction often taking the form of salaries and wages. Um, profit is masquerading under salaries and wages, uh, which is perfectly obvious in the, case of, in the case of bonuses and so on for financial institutions. Um, but it indicates that if the, if the rentier exists, the modern rentier is very different to what we historically uh, think of as uh, the rentier individually and as a social class. <coughs> Let me come, come to Europe. Now I've got about 20, 25 minutes and I'll tell you how I think helps us understand what's happening in Europe. In Europe, I would argue, financialization uh, has works on two levels. Uh, and, and financialization has operated through the common currency, and the two levels have been created through the common currency. And in that sense, uh, we get mature and subordinate sub financialization in Europe, which isn't the same as mature and subordinate financialization globally. It isn't a replication of the phenomenon of Brazil or the phenomenon of Turkey compared to the phenomena of the United States, where you can properly talk about mature and subordinate financialization on a global scale. Here we've got financialization in the sort of German sense uh, and in the Greek, Portuguese, uh, another sense. It's, it is subordinate, all right, and it works through the common currency, through the global aspect of money uh, in both cases, but it has, it has very different implications in Europe because of the commonality of the euro, uh, because of the peculiar aspect of the monetary system. And I wish to uh, discuss that. So, in a sense, the split between core and periphery, which is now pretty much accepted in Europe, um, and that goes back to what both the organizers said in, in the opening, um, in the opening uh, sort of remarks, that Europe is not really um, a project that uh, all European countries participate in equally. It's perfectly clear now. This isn't, a, this isn't an alliance of partners. Um, this is a stratified um, outcome. And we've got core and periphery. And I would argue core and periphery reflects mature and subordinate financialization um, uh, in, 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 in Europe. Why? The European Monetary Union is a very strange creature. It's a form of world money. In, in a sense, it competes against the dollar. So it, it's, it's the European equivalent of the dollar. Uh, it's, a, it's a reserve currency, first and foremost, created to uh, compete against the dollar, fundamentally. This was clear from the Werner report in 1970, uh, that Europe needed a currency of this type. Uh, so it's a formal alliance to create a global reserve currency of this type, so that European big business, big banks, and large enterprises could operate in the, in, in the, in, in the international markets uh, with extra strength. Uh, as it were, which the U.S. banks and the U.S. corporates derive from the dollar. But it's more than that. You don't need the second leg, which is a formal alliance to create a domestic monetary standard, which is what the EMU is. You don't need the second leg to create the first. Right? Europe could have created the first type of money without necessarily creating the second. The EMU has attempted to be both. It's, 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 an, it's, it's, an, international, it's an international alliance, a formal alliance, to create a global monetary standard and a formal alliance to create at the same time a domestic monetary standard and the two coincide. Now that's a very difficult 
and a very complex proposition, as we now know, uh, to, 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 to bring about. And it's a very um, difficult and complex proposition because the international and the domestic roles of the euro basically clash with each other. The nature of the uh, we can understand the, mo the crisis uh, most simply and fundamentally in terms of that. The euro attempts to be international money, the euro attempts to be domestic money, uh, at the same time the two roles clash with each other and the clash creates uh, the crisis that we now see as I will explain uh, in a minute. Um, more than that, the changes that are needed to make the two roles of the euro compatible with each other to me seem most unlikely uh, in Europe at the moment. I'll, I will tell you what the, I think these measures are, uh, these changes are. And this seems to me most unlikely uh, at the moment. The, 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 the clash between the two roles of the euro is likely to continue and therefore I will argue the most likely outcome is some form of breakup um, in Europe unless something very dramatic happens. The last thing I want to say is that this clash of the two roles of the euro, as I will argue, is reflected in mature and subordinate financialization uh, in core uh, and periphery, uh, respectively. Why am I saying this? And I can be fairly quick about it. Essentially, what has happened is that the international role of the euro has reappeared within the EMU. You see, the logic of the EMU uh, was that we will create this global reserve currency and we will deal with the outside world uh, through this global reserve currency. And domestically, we will deal with transactions and so on by using the euro as a domestic currency. The euro is, 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 the, the, is the legal tender, the national domestic currency of all uh, 17 member, member states right now. For that distinction to prevail, it follows immediately that within the EMU there must be no international role for the euro. The international role must be squeezed out. And for about 10 years, this is how it looked. It looked as if this had happened. What we now know is that that's not the case. There is an international role for the euro, internally, domestically, within the EMU. Um, and that's what is not sustainable. This has occurred for three reasons. To squeeze out the international role of the euro domestically, you need to satisfy three conditions, basically. You need to make sure that there is no systematic divergences, uh, there are no systematic divergences in the uh, in inflation rates, and therefore in, in competitiveness. Because competitiveness is basically another take on inflation rates. It's not the same, but it's another take on it. Second, uh, there cannot be systematic imbalances in current accounts. Um, that's the second condition for the international role of the euro to be excluded. And third, there cannot be su sudden and violent shifts in capital flows uh, domestically uh, I I within the EMU. All these conditions have been negated uh, during the last 10 years and they remain uh, uh, unbalanced and that's why I think the clash between the domestic and the international euro within the EMU cannot be sustained. Let me show you a little bit of evidence for that. This is competitiveness. Unit labor costs, a take on inflation, and you see the, 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 the contrast between core and periphery. These are four peripheral countries. Um, it's basically Greece up there. Uh, this is, if I can see well, this is Portugal, this is uh, Spain, and Ireland, uh, which move pretty much together. Greece in the lead in terms of rising unit labor costs and therefore loss of competitiveness. This is, this is in relation to itself. <laughs> this, this doesn't compare countries with each other. This compares unit labor costs to itself and therefore it shows you the divergences in competitiveness. Uh, um, clearly Greece has been losing competitiveness very, very dramatically relative to others. But if you actually look at the four peripheral countries and if you actually look at what's happening on the left hand side, you will see that the rise in unit labor costs isn't that great by itself. This isn't really what's, what's dramatic. What's dramatic is this. That's really the old one out. It's not this. And people forget that uh, because they look at the periphery, because the periphery is weak. This is of course Germany. Germany is the old one out, not the other countries. What's been happening in Germany is that unit labor costs uh, for, a, for a long period of time have been frozen, basically. Um, why? Well, you have to look at German political economy, you have to look at the Schroeder government, you have to look at what happened in, in the country after reunification, the choices made in, in Germany about the direction of, um, 
of the German economy. The choice is made about uh, drive for exports and keeping unit labor costs low. Uh, you, you, you can think in terms of the um, uh, concurrence of the trade unions with this. You can think of huge areas of the country emerging without any trade unions in the East, but increasingly in the West. The whole transformation of Germany that's taken place uh, the last two decades, and it's reflected down here. Essentially, Germany has been gaining competitiveness relative to the periphery um, on the back of low wages. I stress this because people, don't, people misunderstand. They think it's because Germany is more efficient, more productive, and so on. Now, of course, if you compare absolute levels of, co of competitiveness, Germany is ahead, no question. But the increase, the, what matters in economics is the change. Right? The increase in German competitiveness or the loss of competitiveness by the periphery has got nothing to do with the initial position. Uh, it's got to do with what's been happening in, the, in, the, in those countries the last two decades. And what's been happening there is not a gain in productivity. German productivity gains are actually quite weak. Um, those of you who know the German economy will probably realize what I'm talking about. Uh, productivity gains in Greece have been substantially higher than in, than, than in Germany. The only country that's worse in productivity gains, actually in some ways the weakest economy in the Eurozone, is Spain. Uh, Spain is completely, I mean, it's just, Spain is a mess in, in, terms of, um, in, in terms of being able to, to, to compete. But Germany isn't a great success in terms of, you know, using technology. That's not where it comes from. Where it comes from is frozen nominal uh, unit labor costs. Uh, in other words, the gain of German, the gains of German competitiveness have been made on the, backs, on the back of German workers. It's as simple as that. Uh, German households count the pennies and, and live on a very tight budget um, to allow Germany to succeed in this way. So it's not, I would argue it's not, <laughs> anyway, I've argued it. Um, here you can also see, very quickly, and I'll come back to it, the um, counter crisis <coughs> policies adopted by the EU. The counter crisis the policies are here, very clearly seen, destruction of of unit labor costs, the crushing of, uh, of um, labor remuneration. That's the most fundamental aspect of dealing with the crisis in the last two to three years, and Greece is, the, uh, is in the lead. The collapse of um, unit labor costs is astounding, uh, breathtaking in Greece. So <coughs> that's the first part, the, the disparity is emerging within the EMU. The mirror image of that is, of course, what's been happening in the <coughs> current account imbalances uh, in Europe. Because if you've got diverging competitiveness, then you're going to get a diverging um, position in, on, on the current account. It's a simple macro. And the, uh, the, the diverging position is very clear. Germany, from about the introduction of the euro, begins to chalk up huge surpluses on current account, mostly generated from, the, from within the eurozone. And the eurozone peripheries begin to chalk up large, and in the case of Greece, huge current account deficits. Th this, th th these don't sum up to that, because these are small economies. But they show the, 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 the opposing uh, uh, movement. Okay? The, the, the surpluses of one are the deficits um, of the other. Um, the monetary union of Europe, which was supposed to bring the European countries together and create this partnership, is the, is, the, is the most striking period historically of imbalances in Europe. There hasn't been a period like that before. These are the largest imbalances ever in the history of the European economy uh, internally. And that has been created by the EMU, basically, because of the reasons that I've just uh, explained. Here you can also see the, um, the change that's taking place once labor costs began to, 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 to go down. Uh, you can see that the, gaps are, uh, the gap is narrowing. However, it will it'll be a long time before uh, the scissors close uh, I, 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 on, on this basis. The third figure I want to show you is that of capital flows. Um, and again, it follows from the previous two. If competitiveness declines and current account deficits begin to emerge, then someone's got to finance them. Uh, you cannot maintain a current account deficit for very long without someone financing it from abroad. And of course, external finance has meant <coughs> Lending, borrowing from abroad, which was very cheap and easy during the 2000s because of the uh, common space, uh, common banking space, and the, the, the interest rate policy operated by the ECB. And the main, oh God, 
the main lender, or sorry, one of the main lenders were, were German banks. This red figure is other lending, in other words, bank lending. Uh, this is this is this is uh, disaggregated by region. The red figure is to the U, uh, to, to the monetary to, to, to the euro area, and you can see the vast increase towards the end of the 2000s. Uh, the, 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 the bigger the deficits get, the more the indebtedness becomes uh, internationally, and most of the debt comes from German banks, or a large part of the debt comes from German banks. What you can also see is what happens down here when the crisis emerges. A vast and sudden violent change in capital flows as German banks pull back. If it wasn't for the euro, this would have been a classic foreign exchange crisis. There's nothing analytically difficult about it. A deficit, uh, a loss of competitiveness, competitiveness, a deficit, and a sudden change uh, in capital uh, flows. But of course, there is the euro, and it couldn't manifest itself in that way. It couldn't manifest itself as a foreign exchange crisis, but the underlying uh, reality is the same uh, in terms of the analytics of it. So, on all these three uh, scores, the euro could not operate domestically in the way in which it was assumed to operate. It was planned to operate uh, e e effectively, and underneath the common the facade of the common currency, it was operating as an international money. It was it had to operate as an international uh, money, although it wasn't allowed to. And that's where, that's, that's where the crisis comes from, uh, essentially. Now, the result of these trends is what I would argue subordinate uh, peripheral financialization. Uh, the, the easiest way to see it is, the, is, is the vast accumulation of debt in the periphery of, of, the, of the trends that I've just uh, identified. Um, peripheral euro-denominated debt has has, has piled up both for international reasons, which I've been focusing on, but also for domestic reasons. Uh, the international reasons I've explained uh, is the deficits and the need to borrow from abroad. But as that was happening, uh, domestic financialization was also spurred in a subordinate way. It was also spurred because funding became more easily available domestically, and the domestic banks uh, in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece, and elsewhere um, used the available funding to expand domestic credit. Essentially, if you can't compete, keep borrowing. This is basically what happened in the periphery, keep borrowing domestically. So the debt piled up for international reasons, but also for domestic reasons, and domestic financialization uh, exploded. In the case of, although it took different forms in each country, in the case of Spain, it was a real estate uh, bubble. In Greece, there was no real estate bubble worth talking about, but there was sustained consumption uh, domestically, and so on. So this vast debt, that has accumulated in the periphery as a result of the macro picture that I've uh, summed up for you is held mostly by households and by banks, not so much by non-financial enterprises. Financialization works for households and banks. Uh, and it's held also privately and publicly. The largest part of the new debt is actually privately held, even in Greece. The debt that increased in the 2000s was not public debt. The Greek state did not engage in a spree of borrowing. The debt that, was, uh, that exploded in the 2000s was actually private debt uh, in Greece too. Um, what happened with public debt uh, was more complex, and Greece and Portugal are very similar in that respect. Um, public debt increased, but not much. Its composition changed. Because of the increasing financialization of these economies and the, avail the, the availability of borrowing uh, abroad, the composition of public debt changed. And whereas these countries, Greece, Portugal, and so on, borrowed domestically for public purposes previously, they began to borrow internationally. And they began to borrow internationally because presumably the euro was their domestic currency. It didn't look like international borrowing. It looked like domestic borrowing, but it wasn't. Effectively, it was international borrowing masquerading, under, uh, masquerading as domestic borrowing under the euro, and that has been their undoing. Uh, the, the debt appears as domestic, but in reality it's international. Uh, that's the problem that the periphery f faces, and it's a problem that I'm afraid is insoluble uh, under current circumstances, unless there's a dramatic change uh, of the makeup of the um, monetary union. Now, again, I've got about 10 minutes, have I? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to discuss the policy to deal with it uh, now uh, on this basis. Um, EU counter crisis policy. It's, it's been very, very interesting to behold. 
You can just take this off. This. I'm going to die with this one. Um, EU counter crisis uh, policy uh, has not been clearly defined from the beginning. It's 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 been a process uh, and still is fluid. However, it has some key characteristics which I want to mention. The focus undoubtedly has been to fix the international malfunctioning of the euro internally. To fix that, and the choice of methods has been very clear. Austerity, privatization, and liberalization. The holy trinity. Uh, the standard, the standard um, set of um, approaches that we've come to see many, many times before in developing countries. And actually, it shows you it shows you the similarity between subordinate financialization in Europe <laughs> and elsewhere. Um, there is nothing terribly interesting in terms of the mix of policies there. Uh, I, I can't see anything novel. There's nothing terribly It's standard IMF uh, World Bank structural adjustment. Uh, the diff the, the, what is interesting is that it's the first time it's applied to middle-income and high-income countries with such ferocity, rather than low-income developing countries. And they, they've been used to that. And the second e aspect that makes it interesting is that this is the first time it's been applied so ferociously without um, devaluation of the currency. The standard uh, uh, approach of the IMF in another context would have been to go for austerity, privatization, liberalization together with a significant um, devaluation, which of course cannot happen for the reasons that we all know and uh, have just discussed. Other than that, there's nothing interesting uh, in the mix per se. It's standard, mainstream, uh, well-known economic, uh, contemporary economic thinking. In addition to that, fixing the, uh, the operation of the international malfunction of the euro in this way, um, the union has taken the very important step of replacing private capital flows, the figure that I showed you before, the private capital flows bouncing right up, in other words, private lending disappearing uh, in Europe, has been to replace the, the private capital flows with official flows. There's been no reduction of borrowing. People who think that there's a reduction of borrowing, they ought to look at the figures again. There's been no reduction of borrowing. And there's been no reduction of flows. There's been a replacement of flows, private flows, with official flows. That's what's been happening. Actually, the debt, the indebtedness of the periphery has been increasing uh, in absolute and in relative terms. But the flows are official. And they, they, they emanate from the ECB and the EFSF. And increasingly through ELA, uh, Emergency uh, Liquidity uh, assistance, in other words, a very peculiar kind of um, liquidity creation happening domestically under permission by the uh, <coughs> ECB, which means the Bundesbank. Um, so um, these are the two prongs of counter-crisis policy by the um, EU. The results are, as expected, they were actually predicted, um, and the prediction came came true, collapse in demand, um, huge social costs as contraction of output led to increase in unemployment, vast increase in unemployment, and of course the debt position is worsened because you cannot deal with the debt problem by cutting. The debt of nations is not the debt of households. This, this well-established economic um, dictum and conclusion has been forgotten and you get uh, homely economic analysis by politicians, but also by, often by economists who think that, you know, the debt of Portugal is the same thing as the debt of a Portuguese family. It's not. Uh, and the two cannot be dealt in the same uh, <coughs> way. So the debt position is worsened. Um, the worsening of the macro situation has been accompanied by a shortage of domestic private credit uh, in, uh, in the peripheral countries and increasingly in core countries as banks have tended to hold liquidity provided by the um, ECB. And the combination of um, collapsing demand, contracting economy, and a credit crunch has, uh, has meant that, uh, there's been, that the growth has become very problematic in Europe. Europe is entering significant uh, recession, um, and there are rising social tensions. And there, the interdisciplinarity and the, the skills that you represent here yeah, much more than mine would be a great use because, of course, Europe is entering a very difficult social and political period as a result of these underlying trends. Um, 
I interesting, interestingly enough, and here is something I want to, to stress, as these changes are taking place and the outcomes of the, of the crisis have been emerging, what we've also seen is a fragmentation of banking. And that's been an unpredicted, an, an unpredicted uh, outcome. Perhaps in some ways the most important outcome, however, for the, for the stability of the euro. Because you see, when you look at the monetary union, what you will see is that, <coughs> and, 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 what you will see, when you look at the monetary union, what you will see is that its, its sole achievement has been the creation of a homogeneous banking space. Um, the homogeneous banking space has been breaking up because the recession has encouraged <coughs> banks to rely on their states for capital and states to rely on banks for liquidity. And what we've witnessed is actually coming together a, national, a renationalization of banks. In other words, the European Monetary Union is breaking up from within. And this is what Mr. Draghi attempted to do in September when he announced that he would lend freely. It's actually to, 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 to pacify this. He cannot resolve it because it comes from the solvency worries underneath. Uh, the solvency worries for both banks and states. But he can pacify it, and that's what he did. And he had to pacify it because, of course, if you get a nationalization of banks, increasing nationalization of banks, what you're going to get is disparities of interest rates. So you're going to get diverging conditions of, 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 of competition in Europe. You get identical firms having uh, very different access to credit and a very different uh, price for credit for no reason, of the, no fault of their own. Simply because banks are becoming more national, more Portuguese, more Spanish, more German, more Greek. Uh, and that obviously undermines the, uh, the common space, the common uh, monetary and economic space. Is there an alternative? There is. Um, but I just need to enumerate the, the, the conditions to show you how difficult it is. A Marshall Plan for the periphery to raise productivity. A rebalance of the German economy to, to move it away from exports and those domestic demand. Uh, and allow real incomes to, to real wages to increase. Um, debt forgiveness, the debt mountain is vast and can never, cannot really be dealt with in Europe. Uh, a restructuring of finance, a reining in of finance in Europe and income and wealth redistribution uh, in Europe. You just have to enumerate these conditions to see that it's unlikely to happen. And therefore, I would argue, uh, a breakup is likely. A few thoughts on Greece and I'll finish. I promise you, I've got, I need two minutes. Greece is the weak link in this. Oh, it's the elephant in the room. It's, it's difficult to think of Greece as an elephant, but it's here anyway. Um, Greece is at the depression, basically. Greece is in the, in the midst of a depression. The, all these the recession uh, pressures have produced a depression. There's a huge reduction in labor costs, which I showed you. Um, disappearance of liquidity. There's a vast credit crunch in Greece at the moment. You cannot obtain any credit if you're a, sm if you're a small or medium business. And you cannot obtain credit because of the reasons that I've explained. Uh, banks are hoarding liquidity or, or cannot lend. There's a vast contraction of public spending. There's a persistent debt, increasing debt, uh, public and private, which is becoming increasingly uh, unmanageable, and a contraction of all sources of demand with the exception of exports, and exports themselves are not really doing anything very much. They're just increasing uh, a little bit. And in the midst of this, the country is forced to go for further cuts in spending and to aim for uh, a primary surplus, a substantial primary surplus uh, in two to three years' time. It's just madness. There is no other way to describe it. Europe has gone mad. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, there is no way that this will work. No way at all. Um, the, um, <coughs> the options are what? This year there will be significant um, recession. 6% was expected originally. It looks as if it's going to be 7%. The figures for the third quarter in Greece indicate that the recession is becoming deeper. It's accelerating. And it's a classic thing for reasons that I've explained. Consumption is contracting, investment is collapsed. So the contraction in the third quarter was 7%. So contraction this year will probably be 7% altogether in Greece. Uh, 4 to 5% is expected next year. That will be very fortunate. Greece will be very lucky if it escapes with 4 to 5%. It could be anywhere between 5 and 10, depending on what happens to the European and the global uh, economy. Basically, we're talking of war conditions without a war having been declared. Um, unemployment is 25%, pushing towards 30%. There is a vast uh, 
social crisis emerging in the urban centers. There's poverty, there's hidden poverty as well. Uh, poverty that pretends that it isn't, uh, which is modern poverty uh, in, 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 in developed countries. Um, and of course, obviously, there are political implications. When you have a situation like this, the political center is immediately hollows out. Uh, and forces of the left and the right increase, and the most dynamic increase, and most aggressive increase, is by forces of the extreme right. Fascism has re-emerged in Greece. Real fascism. I don't mean, I don't mean the extreme right. I mean fascism um, for for the uh, for, for, for for the for the contemporary period, and that's the creation of the European Monetary Union and the European Union. I hate to say. Uh, what are the options? Well, two options. The Greek people can accept low incomes, huge debt, great inequality, persistent unemployment, and little growth in, indefinitely. That's, it, that's what it is. Right? They can accept that. Um, they might. I doubt it. Um, I think this uh, is likely to be a situation of unrest and social <coughs> explosion. And I think that Greece uh, will probably default and exit. 2012-2013. Um, it looks less likely for 2012 because the forces that want to keep the country in the, in the monetary union are very powerful. But 2013 will be very difficult uh, for the Greek elite to handle the contradictions that are emerging. Very difficult. Uh, and I doubt very much they, they, they will succeed. If Greece defaulted and exited, there would be economic, social and political instability. It would be an opportunity uh, to reset the economy, but it will happen through chaotic conditions, there's no doubt at all about it. Um, that could well be the first step in the unraveling of the European Monetary Union, although of course there'll be many more steps uh, if that eventuality were to come about. Uh, and it could well be the first signal in the reversal of financialization. We don't know if it's going to happen, it's going to go that way, but I think the probability is non negligible uh, any longer. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Professor Lapavitas, for this excellent start for the, for the symposium. Um, I think the conclusions we heard were not very encouraging for, for uh, our European project, but. Uh, but uh, now we have some time for discussion. Now, unfortunately, we are uh, we're a little bit late from our schedule. I suggest that we, we extend this session so that we still 10 or 15 minutes of the coffee break. So, uh, so questions? David Teva. Hi, I'm David Teva, and I'm professor of world politics here at the University of Helsinki. And thank you for the excellent presentation. It was very, very good. I, just one dimension I'm interested in, and I'd like to hear a couple of reflections from you, which had to do with your analogies between the difference between mature and developing countries worldwide, and then the conditions between mature and peripheral parts of Europe. And as he pointed out, it's not the same kind of mechanism of subordination. Uh, the, one of my questions, and perhaps the only one here, is to what extent things are happening also here in northern parts of Europe, which you consider core parts of Europe in your characterization, like increasing precarity of labor, or the increasing disciplinary power of credit rating institutions that actually resemble conditions we associated with the condition of being a developing country, <coughs> and to what extent the core periphery dynamics express themselves in Europe, not only through reproduction of core periphery between North and South Europe, but also with the peripheral, some aspects of developing or peripheral or non-advanced happening here. I understand. So. I understand. Um, in some ways, this is the most difficult issue regarding financialization, because the subordinate dimension of it is a very new thing. Um, financialization has been about for some time, and most of us, of us who've thought about it have thought of, of the developed countries, Germany, Japan, UK, and so on. Financialization in less developed parts of the world is very recent, 
began to emerge in the late 90s in a dynamic way and became and exploded in the 2000s. <coughs> so these are very early ideas. Um, I would argue, and I do argue in this book I've done, that financialization globally pivots on the role of money, on the monetary system. Not finance, but on money. And it pivots on the role of the dollar uh, across the world. And the form it takes in developing countries uh, has to do with <coughs> reserve accumulation. The reserve accumulation of, in other words, accumulation of dollars. The, the structure of world money and world finance has been such that in the last 15 or so years, developing countries have been forced to accumulate vast reserves of dollars. If you sum them up, what you end up seeing is actually there is a reverse flow of capital. We, we think of, you know, in the classic image of the first period of financialization, uh, imperialism, we think of export of capital uh, from developed to developing. This is happening, FDI has increased, bank lending has increased, but if you net it out, if you put reserves in it, the net effect is actually negative. Capital has been flowing to developed countries. Uh, and that is the most peculiar aspect of subordinate financialization. The poor have been financing the rich. And as they've been doing that and accumulating the, these reserves, they've actually spurred financial development domestically. Uh, Brazilian banks can take advantage of the accumulation of reserves which are sterilized by the Brazilian Central Bank to obtain liquid funds through which they can then expand their own lending. And, and, and domestic borrowing and domestic uh, financial activities expand in Brazil. The Brazil financializes. That is how, I, and that is spurred by foreign banks coming in as well. Uh, foreign bank entry trains the domestic banks in these activities. And so you get household lending in Brazil, household lending in Turkey, which didn't exist before, well, exploding in the last 10 years. Uh, there is a subordinate aspect, to, a similar subordinate aspect in Europe, but not in the same way because the peripheral countries have not been accumulating reserves. That's not how it works. Um, capital is coming in, there is domestic expansion of finance, but it's not from accumulation of reserves and it's not from accumulating a foreign currency. Uh, and that's what's made it uh, very peculiar and very strange uh, uh, in the periphery uh, of Europe. Uh, that, that is as much as the, the difference. Now, is concerned. Now, in terms of the conditions of labor and so on, there we can talk about uh, financialization in mature countries too. And financialization is, is based on altering the conditions of labor. It assumes uh, that the conditions of labor will be altered. It is actually based on neoliberalism uh, and the deregulation of the, of the labor market. In a sense, it's the, it's the grounding condition. Uh, you start with that. Um, and that has been the foundation on which uh, countries are financialized, both in mature areas and in developing areas. There is little difference uh, in that respect as, uh, as I understand it. Next question, please. Uh, Mr. Professor, uh, I'm a, a journalist from a Helsinki-based newspaper Helsinki, Helsinki Salamat. And um, I would like to ask a question about um, the unraveling of, of the monetary union. Uh, you, you, are, you said that uh, the uh, exit of Greece would be uh, kind of a first step in the, in the larger unraveling of EMU. Uh, could you elaborate uh, maybe uh, some uh, more uh, the reason why you see that it's the first step? I mean, what could what would happen after that, and what, what like why couldn't EMU, EMU stand without Greece? The reason why I think the monetary union is unstable, the, I mean, there are many reasons which I've just explained. I, I just said that the, the, the system is contradictory and uh, contains tensions which are very hard to manage without drastic, completely uh, dramatic overhaul, the Marshall Plan and so on. If that doesn't happen, it's very difficult to see it sustaining itself. In other words, to put it differently, the real problem is not the absence of a mechanism of fiscal transfers or the um, or the, the, the different role of the, the, the inadequate performance of the European Central Bank. These are important elements, and if they were in place, uh, the crisis would have unfolded in a different way and could have been pacified. Mr. Draghi comes out in September, says he was going to buy bonds if countries enter a program, and immediately the spreads come down, or certainly begin to come down, because it becomes unprofitable to, uh, to speculate against Spanish debt. Essentially, that's what happened in the, in the financial markets. So he, Mr. Draghi can do that because he's got the big guns. Okay? He's got a lot of money uh, that he can create. But he cannot resolve the underlying problem. It's not, for, it's not for Mr. Draghi to resolve the underlying problem, which is that of the fundamental imbalance uh, between um, core and periphery in terms of 
uh, competitiveness and, uh, and so on. Uh, and the policies of austerity that are imposed by the German elite, elite at the moment are actually worsening this. Uh, the fact that France recently, a few days ago, has agreed to enter, to, to go for austerity in a significant way and regain competitiveness, capture competitiveness by, by driving labor costs down, and so by replicating the German path, is a sign that the European monetary union is collapsing. Because that, that exacerbates the tensions. It doesn't resolve them. We cannot all become like Germany. It's impossible to have a monetary union in which everybody will have a surplus from within and everybody will keep wages low. That, 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 you can't do that. Um, so um, that is the real reason why I think the, the system is unstable. Now, if Greece steps, I mean, fr from, the real, fr from, the, from the underlying reason to the immediate reason of, uh, of, 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 of unraveling, there are many steps. Um, if Greece leaves, and I think it will become very, very difficult for the country to stay in next year, um, if Greece leaves, then the shock will be very great, and it will act as a, it will act as a, a spur for others, um, it will create uh, tensions, it will create fractions uh, in, the bond, in, 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 the, uh, in the bond markets, and in the management of debt by Portugal, Spain, Italy, and so on. Uh, it will be a big, big shock. Um, in that way. Thomas Wagner. I'm Thomas Wagner from, from here and also from Corporate Euro Observatory. It's nice to you. Um, I would like to continue that to note uh, uh, whether, uh, whether austerity for all is a viable option. It's an educated guess that it's not. That's a popular guess in the with the people I'm, I'm, I'm moving around with. Uh, but it's a gamble. Uh, with very high stakes, and uh, it seems that people are betting uh, on the possibility of getting a, do uh, a dose enough population uh, for that to stabilize. That's just an observation. The questions I have were uh, uh, about, uh, it's a minor question, uh, but it, it has interest for me. It's a question about financialization in the developing world. Uh, I have rejections with the idea of material developing, but let's leave that aside. Uh, I was thinking of microfinance uh, and the integration of the very poor uh, in the international economic system and whether you have views on the role that has played in, in the financial session of the world. Again, very big questions. Um, austerity for all will not work. I doubt very much it will work unless, as I indicated, for example, in the case of Greece, it's clear. If the Greek people accept the situation in which they will live on 340, 50, 400 euros a month, the, you know, monthly income. They will live on uh, monthly wage. They will live on that. that would, the wage will be driven down to that. Um, they, will, they will have a welfare state that's been, that will have been completely uh, disorganized. That, that there will be no growth worth talking about uh, for, for, for many, many years. That there will be permanent high unemployment. That there will be migration uh, of, of the young. And there will be a permanent burden of debt pressing down on the country <coughs> indefinitely. Then, yes, they can, they can remain in the, in the monetary union. Um, uh, and austerity will, will do that. It will be like creating a vast East Germany across uh, the south of Europe without the fiscal transfers, uh, you know, without without providing, you know, without West Germany being there to provide these fiscal transfers that made things easier. That's basically um, what I think uh, will take place in much uh, of the south. It's uh, unsustainable. Now, in, politically and socially, I think. Um, now, in terms of um, uh, developing country uh, financialization, and again, I know what you mean about mature and subordinate, but you tell me. You give, to, you give to me a better, a better term and I will gladly use it. Uh, <laughs> if you think about it, you see how difficult it is to, to, to find an appropriate uh, terminology. Um, the, the, the involvement of the very, very poor, um, the microfinance, uh, the involvement of the very, very poor with a formal financial system or with microfinance uh, uh, in, uh, organizations is interesting, but it's not really a fundamental part of financialization because the very, very poor have, are not much of a terrain for sustained expansion of formal finance. They would do it and they would make profit out of it, but the incomes of the very, very poor do not really justify uh, and, and merit uh, particular focus by the financial, formal financial institutions. Uh, that's why you get what I call subordinate financialization, typically in middle-income countries. It's when you begin to get a substantial uh, 
average income, uh, GDP per capita, uh, that it becomes profitable and meaningful for domestic banks to engage in these activities. That's why you get it in Brazil, that's why you get it in Turkey, that's where you, you get it in part of Indi parts of India, uh, and so on. That's how it's, mi it's a middle-income country phenomenon, or countries that, that are approaching the middle-income uh, status. I would argue. Last word. Yeah, uh, last word from, uh, from the University of Helsinki, but I'm maybe and then uh, Faculty of Law, but I'm now talking more about as, uh, as uh, ex-central banking economist. And, and there, are, I, I mean, I think your, your presentation was very interesting, and, and this obviously it brings new new uh, new uh, elements to the analysis and balances. And I, I think I can I can agree with, with, with a lot of that. But what is a little bit striking to me is, is this uh, bashing of, of Germany for behaving uh, exactly as, as it should in, in a monetary union where the founding uh, constitutional principle was price stability. That when they, they saw that they lost their competitiveness, they needed to make some efforts, and I, I think they, they weren't particularly easy efforts they had to make in, in 2000, as well, to And they, I mean, basically achieved the price stability, not, not more. They didn't have, a, uh, as you said, I mean, productivity hasn't been particularly good. So they have behaved as you should in that type of monetary union, what we agreed upon. And then, uh, as, you, as you showed, I mean, it is completely impossible to have uh, unit labor costs uh, increasing 30, 40 percent if your productivity, whenever, or in, in the monetary union, with, with the inflation at maximum 2 percent. I mean, you end up in trouble, and then we, everybody saw that. It, it, you know, and now, accusing Germany for that seems a little bit unfair. I'm not accusing Germany. I'm just, I'm just, point, I'm just p putting my finger on where the problem lies to, from, from, from my perspective. The, the problem is, you see, peripheral Europe joined this monetary union with the prospect of catching up, the prospect of prosperity and growth, uh, and, 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 and raising living standards. Um, instead of that, what's being created now is a situation of permanent austerity. Um, Monetary unions are like that. The monetary uh, monetary systems are like that. Uh, basically, you, you have a whole ho a host of countries of economies that were uh, soft, trying to enter a hard money um, system. And the, the country that created the hard money system made no allowance uh, for the nature of economies that were that, that were entering. The, the expectation was the hard money will force these economies to become hard themselves. Well, it doesn't it doesn't work that way. Uh, now. You might ask, should that, does this mean that Germany um, should have changed its own outlook? I think it does, yes. Because the, the, the German choice uh, for macroeconomic policy was contested terrain. There were people in Germany who argued against it. Um, it the Bundesbank prevailed, and the conservative uh, outlook prevailed. There were people who were arguing for strengthening domestic demand in Germany, for weakening the, the emphasis on exports and the, and the drive towards exports, and they lost out. And, and, and German political economy was determined by this complex of banks and, and export-oriented uh, businesses that were very, very powerful uh, in Germany. And that's, these are the results you see. Because when you do that in a monetary union, in an economy which is already more competitive than another, or, or than the others, that's what you're going to get. There, is no, there, there will be no miracles. Uh, uh, you're going to get these, these, these divergences. And that's what you're going you're to get with France now. Uh, it will be a similar pattern with France. So if Germany wants the monetary union to survive, it, better, it, should, you know, it has to rethink uh, the way it, um, it is organizing both monetary stability um, and economic policy altogether. As you know, there's a big debate in, within the Bundesbank about the ECB at the moment. I believe that Mr. Draghi is being referred to. Uh, Goethe has been mobilized to, uh, to to refer to Mr. Draghi, or Faust, and so on. That uh, that Miss um, Merkel has uh, struck a deal with uh, the devil, and the devil is uh, the devil is, uh, is is Draghi. Now that's 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 indicative of the kind of thinking of the conservative of conservative thinking in Germany, um, which which will bring destruction to the monetary union because. If you go for price stability of this type, if you keep no, uh, lab, nominal unit labor costs uh, low in this way, then either you create permanent austerity <laughs> across the board or you create uh, tensions, um, uh, imbalances. And 
Germany has to rethink. It needs to go for a different strategy if it, w if it wants the monetary union to survive. It needs to strengthen domestic demand. It needs to place less emphasis uh, on exports. The economies of Europe must be rebalanced if the thing is to survive. Let's take one more brief question and a brief answer. I'll just take it. Yeah, I just a very brief comment on the question. So the, the, the comment is that I think that uh, I mean, it's been a great talk, but I, I had to go very quickly, but I think still to say that the rise of Greek fascism or Hungarian fascism for that matter is the responsibility of the European Union is a little steep. Uh, and uh, and I, that, that's, that's just a comment. It's, it's, I think it's a little, little bold. Uh, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to ask, and that's, that's the, the real question is, is um, Again, it had to go quickly, but 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 uh, to request a little more detail because I'm, I'm not an economist. But it seems to me that there might be other factors uh, responsible for uh, the success or whatever you want to call it of the German economy, apart from low wages, such as sectoral uh, the sectoral structure of the economy or uh, spatial uh, description. That, relative spatial equality of the economy and, and things like that. And surely those, uh, or, or, or the size division, the, the dominance of uh, medium-sized enterprises and, and things like that. And would you agree with that? And, and, and if you do, doesn't that mean that the problem is actually even deeper? Because those things are even harder to fix than to change these macro policies that you talked about. I appreciate your questions. Um, yeah, indeed, the um, financialization in Germany has actually been quite different from, from financialization elsewhere, uh, as I pointed out. And Germany has retained a lot of strength in uh, the secondary sector, um, manufacturing and other strength. It's been persistent at that, and it's been right to do so. It's, a successful, it's been a successful strategy. Germany has gone for, there hasn't been a housing bubble in Germany, and that is a profound importance for its current, the state of its economy at the moment. So all these are very, very important elements. And if you bring, if you bring in the long-standing historical uh, aspects, the middle stand and, and, and all the rest of it with, with the, the structure of the financial system, these are, these are considerable strengths. Of course, they're, they're not going to change easily. Um, however, the key element for the gain of competitiveness remains low nominal uh, 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 labor costs. No question at all about it. Um, that's what's been driving it, uh, and that is the result of policy choices. Not, not the structure of the economy, but policy choices, choices uh, at the level of the government and together with the trade unions. It's a, you know how German political economy works, that's been a fundamental part of it. It's a choice that the, the German elite made after reunification, uh, confronted with the idea of creating a, a monetary union. Uh, and these are the results. The error there, the political economy error there, is not so much from the, by the periphery. The country that is really miscalculated, if you really want to discuss the political economy, is France. France has made the biggest mis miscalculation. The French are beginning to realize that gradually now. Because, of course, the monetary union was uh, a political uh, calculation to create a system whereby a reunified Germany will be um, tied up and, 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 and related to France in a way that the, 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 the French power would be able to exercise some influence. Well, talk about historic miscalculations. It hasn't been like that at all. And France has emerged as a subordinate, really, partner uh, in this. This is now perfectly clear. And the reason is this, uh, fundamentally. Um, now, when it comes to... Um, fascism, which is your last question, and again, you know, I'm being schematic here, but I want to defend what I said in this way. The, the, the European Union is perceived as this benign project that has pacified oppositions and historic enmities in Europe. And I suppose to a certain extent he has done that. I do not wish to, defi to, 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 to deny this if you look at the historic enmity between France and Germany, for instance. Uh, the point is, however, that in recent years, it's become very clear, the European Union is actually creating new divisions and new differences and new tensions. These are not the ancient tensions coming up because for some unex unexplained reason the European Union has not worked well and the ancient uh, historic old uh, oppositions are, are coming up again. No, these are new uh, differences. 
uh, the way the Greeks and the Germans have have talked about each other is a new thing. Uh, it's been created by the, the way the, uh, the, the, the European Union has worked. And in that respect, the rise of fascism, I would say, uh, of course, has domestic reasons, domestic foundations, and I'm happy to discuss them on another occasion, but the broader context is that of, a, of an economic and social uh, situation which is intolerable, uh, impossible to handle, and that's been created by the monetary union and the policies of the EU. It's in that respect that I would defend the statement I made. The EU has created a monster, uh, and it better take uh, some action to deal with it, because if it becomes established, and if it takes power, then it's very difficult to handle. All right. Thank you once more. Thank you.